Alrighty, we're gonna get started. Hello everybody, my name is Jenny Kim. I use she or her pronouns and I'm a career education coordinator with the Career Center. And today we're gonna to talk about resume and cover letter writing. So I want you all to stay engaged during this video. So sometimes I'll ask a question and I'll pause. When I'm pausing, my hope is that you think about how you would answer if we were live in a classroom doing a workshop. Please follow along using your own resume and take notes and email me questions that come up. What we're gonna to cover today is resume formatting and writing and cover letter writing. So resumes, what is the purpose of a resume? So for you, the purpose is to introduce yourself to an employer, demonstrate your communication skills. You're literally demonstrating your writing communication skills because you're submitting a piece of your own writing. And ultimately, the hope is to get an interview. And from the employer side is to learn about who you are, to determine if you have the skills and qualifications for the job, and then determine if they should spend the time to interview you. So ultimately, both of your goals is to end up doing an interview. So let's talk a little bit about formatting a resume. We're gonna start at the beginning and then we're gonna just go from there. So um, first thing on a resume is your header. So your header has to have, in the very least, your name or initials and contact information. Now, some folks might wonder why do I need to put, why would I put my initials and not my name? Um, some people also ask me, am I allowed to put my nickname? Do I have to put my full name? So as you see here, um, I have, my name written out on the bottom, but that uh, Jenny is not my legal name. Um, and I might use my initials because I'm afraid of bias showing up in the job search. So my last name is Kim, that's a Korean last name. And so someone might make an assumption about my racial identity based on that. And if I'm worried about that, then I might put Jenny K or I just might put JK, um, which, Maybe I shouldn't do just JK because then people are going to think that I'm kidding around with them. Um, but there are multiple reasons people might put their initials instead of their full name. So just consider that. Some other things that you can put on the header are city and state. So where you're currently located. Now, some might ask, why would I not put my city and state on there? And um, go ahead and think about why that might be before I tell you why. So as you probably thought, uh, you might not want to put city and state if you're trying to move out of state. This is so that employers don't immediately put you in the no pile because they don't want to have to pay for your moving expenses or that sort of thing, or they don't want to go through the trouble of flying you out for an interview. We want to make them get excited about you as an applicant before they make those judgments. So if you're looking to apply out of state, you might decide not to put your city and state on there. You do not need to put your full address like your street address that is from back in the days when you used to mail your resume and cover letter um i imagine that episode in friends where rachel is sending off her resumes out on the envelopes and um yeah we don't do that anymore so no need to put your full street address <clears throat> we have um a possibility for a portfolio. So some of you might be in programs where through your capstone course you're being asked to put together like an online pro portfolio. So that might be that you are a graphic design student, a journalism student, computer science, and you have a GitHub. Um, go ahead and put that por uh, portfolio link on there if you want the employer to see some examples of your work. So you can also put your URL to your LinkedIn account. Um, a reason that you might do that is because you want a large resume that has everything there. So a lot of you have probably heard that your resume should be one pages, maybe two if you're a graduate or doctoral student. Um, and it also kind of depends on the industry. So some of you might be getting a master's degree and learn that industry-wise you should only be submitting a one-page resume. Your LinkedIn can be used as your master resume. And so it gives the opportunity for an employer to look at more than just the experiences you were able to fit on that one page. Now, with a LinkedIn profile, you do run the risk of bias once again showing up. Um, there's assumptions that can be made about your identities um, based on your photo. And so I said earlier that some people might see my last name and assume that I am um, Asian. They might see my first name and assume that I identify as a woman. And so, um, but then they could also think, oh, well, maybe um, her last name is based on her spouse's last name. And so, um, 
and then they click on the LinkedIn profile and then they, they get some confirmation of like, oh yes, this person is Asian. And what, what does that mean for me? What does it mean for them? And I would also say, I, I want to encourage you all to be yourselves in this process to the most that you can. So I am in a privileged spot right now where I have a stable job and an income. And so if I do to apply to something else and they decide not to interview me because of that reason, I have um, some power in, to, in self agency to be like, well, then I don't want to interview for you. And so I don't bring up the bias that can show up in this as a way to deter you from doing things. My hope is that you could be yourself in this process. And I want to acknowledge for some of us, that's just not possible. All righty. So qualification section. I like to have the next part of my resume always be a qualification section that highlights the skills and experience specifically to that job. So if you're looking at the required um, the qualifications that are on the job posting, I like to highlight those immediately so that the employer doesn't have to read through the, in between the lines, read through the entire resume because they might not read through the entire resume to find that I have the skills and experiences that they're looking for. So here's an example of what that might look like. So what um, in this qualification section, I have two years of customer service experience at University Housing, providing customers with a positive experience on using communication and problem solving skills. Um, so I'm going to have you on a moment here. Take a look at this. And I would like you to underline or write down on a piece of paper for each of these bullet points, what is the skill that I'm highlighting in each of them? So go ahead, um, pause the video if you need to. I am going to take like a 10 second pause here to allow you to do this. So once again, just underline or write down the skills that each bullet point is highlighting. So here's how I um, saw the skills being highlight underlined. It could be, you could be seeing something different. There might be um, something else that you pulled out of here that I just didn't, and that's perfectly fine. So the first one, we have customer service, communication, and problem solving skills. For the second one, we have time management skills. So sometimes it's really hard to write about your ability to manage your time in a specific experience. So that's why I like to highlight here one way that you can go about doing that. So in this example, the person is saying, I achieved this high GPA while managing multiple things. And that's one way to <clears throat> allow an employer to see that you can manage your time. And then the bottom one is, is, is a technical skill. So we're in a moment here, I'm gonna talk about a skill section and if I do or don't recommend it. Um, but I wanted to highlight here for after we get to that section that there are technical skills showing up in this qualification section. So this might be a way to talk about some of those technical skills that you don't wanna make a whole new category for in your resume because it takes up space. Um, but the employer is looking for these sorts of skills. All right, so we, next we have education section. So here I'm trying to give some different ways that your education might show up. So some of you might have a concentration within your major. Some of you might be getting a minor. And so this is one example of a way that you might write that sort of thing. Um, it's not the end all be all. Uh, it's not a rule. It's just a recommendation. So here we have um, Bachelor of Science in, in Data Science with a concentration in data visualization and then a minor in computer science. So this person decided to bold the minor in computer science because the job that they are applying for not only asks for the ability to do um, the data science, but wants that um, computer background as well. Uh, now, if, you're, if you felt like you're a minor, for example, my minor, I have a minor in sociology, um, I may or may not bold that depending on what I'm applying for and if I feel like it's relevant to the work. Um, I think to, I don't even have my minor on there. So also know that you don't have to put everything about yourself on your resume. It's up to you and based on what's relevant and what do you have space for. And that's what I'm going to say a lot throughout this presentation is you have one page. And so make the most of that page and make the decisions of what is important enough for this specific job, what is relevant to this job, what is important to me that this employer knows it about. So keep that in mind while you're trying to figure out how do I fit this all. Um, one thing I don't go into on a slide, so I want to mention now, is like the 
big picture formatting. So we recommend not going to a font size lower than 10 um, and not doing margins smaller than half an inch. So know that you have the option to go to a, ha a half an inch and that may give you some more room to write um, a couple additional lines. We have expected graduation May 2020, so we don't put when we started the degree because we don't really need to. Um, if I had already graduated, I would just take out the expected and it would just read May 2020. Um, do you have to put your GPA? That's completely up to you. So this person was proud of their 3.6. They wrote about it in their qualification section and now they're highlighting it again. Um, but it's not necessary. I would say uh, GPA is only required if let's say you're applying for an internship and it requires a specific GPA and they're asking you to send them your transcripts, they're going to see your transcripts anyways. And so if you do meet that GPA threshold, definitely put it on there so it's an easy check mark for them um, to say, yes, this person has it, let's move them into the yes pile. What if you started at a different university? So um, it depends if you put that there or not. So let's say you started at Front Range Community College and you're applying to work at Front Range Community College, definitely put that on there because you're going to have that sort of connection. Um, sometimes you'll be, employing, um, you'll be applying to an organization where you don't know if the hiring managers, you, you don't know their background, um, but you might find out that they went to community college first and that is something that's important to them and that is exciting. So if you have the ability um, or you know anyone who works for the organization, it's a good thing to talk about and ask, you know, what is the culture? What are people's feelings about transferring and that sort of thing? Um, let's say you started your bachelor's degree at a different university and you transferred into CSU. It's completely up to you, once again, if you want to put that on there or not. Um, all you really have to put on there, um, assuming that the job requires a degree, is that you have the degree. So, um, it's up to you how much space you want to take in terms of putting different universities on there. I tell folks as well, if they started at a community college and they got an associate's degree and they um, are proud of that and or that associate's degree is relevant to the job they're applying for, then put it on there. So a lot of this will come up down to your decisions. What do you want to do with your resume? All right. Should I include a skills section? So I love using this example. I, I found this on a template on a website. Um, I'd also like to mention real quick that I do not recommend using templates. They can be really hard to edit. For any of you who've tried one, you might have already experienced this. And so sometimes you're better off making it yourself. Anyway, so I saw this on, on a template. And first I laughed because like, we're talking five-star ratings. And then I look at Python and I'm like, why would you highlight anything that only has two out of five stars on it? Um, and third, how believable is this? So if I walked in here right now and I said, it, it, well, walked into the room you are right now and I said, I have organization skills. Like how, how, how much are you gonna actually believe that? So um, I don't recommend a skill section. Um, this doesn't explain how you use these skills. It doesn't prove you have the skills. So instead, I recommend um, all of these skills should show up in your bullet points. Now, I did mention before in the qualification section that, that technical skills are very different. And so those might not easily show up, or you may really need to highlight those if you're working in a like, very tech industry. Um, but in terms of skills like customer service problem solving, I think there's better ways for us to showcase these sort of skills. The purpose of an experience section is to demonstrate to the employer the skills you have and how you use them. So what experiences count? They all do. So paid, unpaid, formal, informal, volunteer, class projects and labs, any experience that you've had can show up in your resume. It all depends on what is relevant and what is transferable. And by transferable, I mean these are skills that employers need across industries, across jobs. So some of the skills that come to mind are communication, leadership, teamwork, problem solving skills. Um, and so we can highlight these in different experiences. So maybe you write about a lab that you worked um, in that, or it's even a lab that you took as a coursework and that you worked on a team, um, or you took a leadership role in a group project, 
or you were working in a customer service setting and you had to demonstrate a lot of problem solving skills. Sometimes employers aren't really clear about these sorts of skills and what they're looking for. Um, so when you don't know the exact skills that they want, usually the job description will have some details and give you an idea. Um, so what we have here are the top 10 attributes employers seek on a candidate's resume, specifically a recent graduate's resume. So when you can't find the exact skills that the employer is looking for, these are some that you can probably lean on and make sure show up in your resume somewhere. Work experience. So now let's talk about what this part of your resume might look like. So we have the um, job title bulleted, so Allison team member, and then we have where you worked, so the residential dining or who you worked for, so residential dining services. We have the time period that you worked there, so September 2017, and then this person is currently in this position, um, and City State, so Fort Collins, Colorado. Now, we're going to go more in depth about what these bullet points should look like and how um, the formula to set them up. But for now, I'll just read one of them out to give you an idea. So assist all students who come into the dining hall by checking in over 100 students every hour, developing skills to succeed in working in a fast-paced environment. So in our section, you might consider having this leadership and involvement. So in this section, you could highlight volunteer experience, um, student organizations you've been a part of, and that sort of thing. So in here, this person is highlighting that they were a president of a student organization, um, and then that they also took part in some volunteer experience. Notice how this section looks identical to the way the experience section is set up. Set up. So don't undermine the skills and experiences that you've had that haven't been paid. Um, these can demonstrate a lot of great things to employers and should definitely be included when you have the space and when they're relevant. Another section you might have is class projects and or presentations. In this example, it's relevant projects. And so this person is highlighting some of their ability to use technology such as Python and R. So the qualification section said they had experience doing it. And now here, the employer is getting a better sense of how they know how to use that technology. Um, this is something you can consider doing for uh, lab work or um, those big class projects that you worked on. Even if you're applying, let's say you're applying for a research position and you've written a lot of literature reviews for some of your classes, you can write about those experiences here and highlight those skills. I'd like to say that, you know, College already costs a lot of money. It shouldn't just show up in the one place on your resume that says education. Let's make sure it shows up in multiple places so that you're really showing an employer how much you've learned um, during your time at CSU. Alrighty, bullet points. So underneath your experiences, regardless if they're leadership, involvement, class projects, paid experiences, you're gonna wanna follow this formula and it is action verb, skill set and then result, accomplishment, or purpose. So what I'd like you to do here is, this is back to that Allison team member example. I would like you to, um, you can take notes. I know this says circle, underline, and box, and you might not have physical copy of the resume. So um, identify the action verb of each of these bullet points, underline the skills that's being demonstrated, and then put a box around the results. So go ahead and take a moment to do that. Feel free to pause the video if you need to. So here's what I came up with. As you can see, sometimes the skill set and the result are overlapping. Sometimes the action verb and the result or purpose are overlapping. And that's perfectly fine. Um, it'd be very hard to write every bullet point like this last one that is exactly in the order. Now, part of the order that does need to stay the same is the action verb. It needs to start with an action verb. Now, the reason why you might start with an action verb is an employer doesn't have to read your resume word for word. They may not spend a lot of time on it. So when you're skimming a document, you read probably at least the first word of every line. And so your action verbs can immediately tell the employer some of the skills that you already have. And that will engage them and encourage them to continue to read your resume. So I don't recommend using action verbs like the word work 
I think there are a lot better action verbs that can highlight some of your skills. So now let's talk about the tense of the verb. So if the experience is current, you're going to be writing the action verb in present tense. So create, facilitate, organize. And if the experience has already been completed, you'll use the words created, facilitated, organized, and so on and so forth. So let's take a moment and have you actually practice writing a bullet point. So on the left here, I have a relatively vague job posting. Um, so what I want you to do first is identify the skills that they're looking for. And then think of an experience that you've had in the past five years and write a bullet point statement about that experience and the skill that you chose from the job description. Um, I'm not going to take too long of a pause here, so definitely pause the video now to make sure you have enough time to complete this activity. What else can go on the resume? We have accomplishments, certifications, affiliations to student organizations and groups. Um, we already talked a little bit about the LinkedIn profile or portfolio website. You can also even share an extracurricular activity that you do here or there that um, you don't feel like necessarily lines up but might be a fun thing just to add to give your resume some like of you in it. That makes sense. So when deciding what of these things you're going to put on, uh, once again, what is relevant, what is transferable, and what are you okay with the employer know knowing about you? So one thing that might come up is you might be involved in a student group that is identity-based. And so if you wrote out the name of that organization, it might give away parts of your identity that you're not ready to share with the employer. Um, I say that if you had a leadership role in that student organization, and if you feel comfortable, I would in the very least put that you were their president of a student organization. Now you don't need to name that organization. I do want to acknowledge that if you did do that, it is possible in an interview that the employer might ask you what the student or organization was. Um, decide what works best for you and what you're most comfortable sharing. Just so you all know, hiring managers want to see some of your hobbies and extracurriculars, your volunteer experiences and that sort of thing. So definitely um, consider putting some of this stuff on, on your resume. I just wanted to give you all an idea of what these additional sections could look like. So we have awards and recognitions here, um, certifications. So just some ideas of what that might look like on your resume. Now, some of you may be asked to write a CV or a curriculum vitae. Um, that's Latin for a course of life. You might be requested to submit one of these if you're applying for a teaching position with the college or university or a research position, even possibly a grad school application. The formatting is a little bit different than a resume. So a CV and a resume are different things. Um, the CV tends to have additional sections or the, the section titles are a little bit different or a little more specific. So if you are ever asked to write a CV for something, please feel free to reach out to the Career Center and we can help you through that process. Alrighty, let's go into cover letter writing now. Uh, I also want to tell you all that I just recorded this, but I didn't record it. So I just did this entire video without recording it. So hopefully it shows up better the second time. Alrighty, so cover letter writing. So a cover letter is a little more detail about your experiences. So a lot of the times I hear this when I say, have you written a cover letter? But I already showed them everything on my resume and there's like an anger and I don't wanna do this. So I like to reframe that to be, now I get to let myself shine, give more context and tell them why we're a good match. So there's a little more storytelling that happen, happens here and an opportunity to highlight some of your skills in a different way. Some important things you need to do before you write your cover letter is you need to do some research on the organization or the company. So what are the company's um, values? What are it's their mission, their vision, strategic plan? Anything you can find on their website that gives you a little more context into what this organization is like or might, what it might look like working for them. If you know somebody within the organization, I recommend doing a, an informational interview. And so that would be calling them up or having coffee and asking them about their experiences, learning a little bit more about the culture of the, of the office or the organization and those sorts of things. 
you're not asking them for a job during this. So please make it very clear. You're just trying to learn some information and you're not asking them to necessarily go in and put a good word for you. Now, ideally they are gonna go put in a good word for you. And you don't wanna ask them that because then it doesn't seem like you actually really care about hearing about their experiences. And then make sure you're very familiar with the job posting. What are they asking for and how do you contribute to that? One of the other reasons why you wanna do all this research is it could tell you if this is actually an organization you wanna work for. Now I understand that getting a job to pay bills and, and rent and that sort of thing may be your top priority and you may not have the ability right now at this moment to make some of those decisions of, I don't wanna work for this company because I don't believe in their mission. So I totally understand that. And what I encourage you to do is, as you continue to gain experiences and you're looking for your second and third job, um, after you're done with this experience, that you're um, not forgetting that, that you get to choose where you want to work. And so when you have the, the ability to do that, I encourage you to do so. Um, another thing that you can, can think about when you're writing your cover letter is there are um, several things employers are concerned about when they're hiring. Um, the top two that come to my mind are they're um, wanting to make sure the person that they're hiring is going to be retained. So it's going to be very important to them that the person has done their research and knows what this company is, how they function. That way they have a better idea that you understand what you're getting yourself into and that you'll stay longer. Um, if an employee only stays for a year, the company lo loses a lot of money because they spent a lot of money training you. The second thing that they're thinking about is, does this person already have a lot of the skills or experiences and or is easily trainable to get these skills and experiences so that they can do the job. And that just frees up the employer's time. If I'm spending most of my time training you over and over again, then that once again goes to um, not being able to do my own job, it being a little more stressful for me as the supervisor. So think about that when you're writing the cover letter as well, is, is there ways for you to tie in how you're trainable or when you were given feedback at one point and how you changed the way you worked and that sort of thing. All right, let's get into the cover letter itself. So the first paragraph or the intro paragraph, you're gonna to wanna to get their attention. So make sure um, that the following is in this paragraph. You wanna state the title of the position. So making it very clear that you wrote this, this cover letter for them, not for the 20 other companies you're applying for. And they shouldn't be the same cover letter as the 20 other companies you've been applying for. Open with why you're interested or a connection you have based on the research you've done and briefly state what are your qualifications. This intro paragraph is only th three, four sentences and I'm gonna show you an example one right here. So at the bottom of the screen, you'll see there is um, an example of an intro. What I would like you to do is I'd like you to read through this and try to identify what do you think the missions, what do you think the company's mission is? What are some of the company's values? And what skills do you think that this job posting is looking for? So pause the video, read over it, and then unpause when you have some answers. Alrighty, so here's a mission, company goal, values, and a short position description. So hopefully what you identified on here is that the mission or the company goal is something along the lines of um, people committed to creating a sustainable underwater community. Some of the values that I wrote that I share are service and innovation. So those are two out of five. Please do not write all five of their values. Um, but it just seems kind of fake that you would have all the same five values. Like really focus in on the ones that you really do have and that are, are really strong and salient for you. Um, it might be one value and that's perfectly fine. So make, just make sure that um, you're picking real values that you have and that you're not making things up here. And then in this um, intro, I also talk about um, a background in economics and community building right down here. So the position description asks for that sort of thing as well. Alrighty, so the middle of your cover letter, the meat of it all, um, is marketing your skills. So this is where you're doing some storytelling. I'm going to go into another slide in a moment here that talks more about storytelling. But um, 
the basics of what should be in this paragraph are you aligning your skills to the skills of that job. You are painting a picture for the employer of you already doing this job. So the less um, that they have to um, puzzle together of, oh, this person seems to be able to work on a team and that would translate into this job. The more that you're just clearly explicitly stating, I have this experience, here's how it ties into this position, the better. Um, write about how you've demonstrated your qualifications. So in the resume, we had the qualification section that just briefly stated that there were, we had two years of customer service experience. This is our opportunity to talk more about what that looks like. What does it look like when you're doing customer service? Once again, painting that picture of you already doing the job. And then include specific results or outcomes when you've used a skill um, when applicable. So here's an example of um, me talking about the demonstration of my qualifications. So as an economics student, I had the opportunity to work on many teams during my undergraduate career. Yada, yada, yada. So go ahead and pause the video. Take a moment to read through this. I'm not going to sit here and read it to you. Um, and then once you're done reading it, go ahead and um, hit the unpause button and we'll go to the next slide. Alrighty, let's talk about storytelling. So when you're writing your cover letter, I want you to try to identify the top skills or strengths that the job is asking for. And then think about a story of a time that you use those skills and or strengths. And then you're going to run and write that story down. You can also share it verbally with somebody if external processing works better for you. Make sure you're giving enough context that you're really painting that picture so that I'm watching you in this experience and um, make sure it has specific examples. Then at the end of the story, make sure you're tying it all together to how this skill or strength and uh, skills or strengths will apply to this position. So I'm gonna read this one because it's a little bit shorter, but hopefully you're getting at least some sort of image of me in this experience. So a unique skill set I bring to the position is my ability to look at an issue from multiple perspectives and come up with a solution that uses strengths of those on the team I work on. When I was an intern at Aero Electronics, I worked with a team of six other college seniors from around the world on a project building a hologram communication device. During our planning stages of our project, we ran into a problem with how to get the optics to project a hologram without a cover on the device to hold the light. One of my team members had experience working on collapsible technology and another with the experience of optics technology. Knowing this, I proposed a device that had a collapsible cover that could project light in a contained space. This idea helped us spark additional ideas from another team member. We ended up winning second place in, th in the internship competition of over 25 teams. My ability to see multiple people's strengths and bring them together makes me an effective team leader and is an asset I will bring to this position. So my hope is that you had a bit of an idea of what was going on there. Um, this is a made up example. I was thinking, um, I was thinking a lot of Star Wars-y thing where they have like the holograms that show up on their watch and how cool that would be. Um, but anyways, storytelling, painting the picture, really giving the employer an idea of how you do the work. And then we just bring it all full circle. So we're going to restate your interest in the organization. We're going to include how to best contact you and thank them for their time. So an example here is through my multiple classroom experiences in education, I have a strong understanding of how an economy in an underwater community could work. I'm excited to share my ideas with the team and listen to ideas those already at Ocean Water Solutions. Thank you for your time and consideration. Please feel free to contact me using the contact information listed above. I look forward to speaking with you soon. Once you're done with your cover letter, um, read through it and look for I think, I believe, and I feel. So I see this show up a lot on cover letters, specifically with those who have identities that have been socialized not to talk about our strengths and how um, we've been successful. So we might cover up our strengths or experiences with, well, I feel like I would be a great team member versus I would be a great team member. So look out for those words. At the end of the day, you want it to sound like you. And so if having those, those words in there make it 
feel more like you, then keep them. But I want to bring it up because I do see it um, a lot on cover letters and there's a little bit of confidence that we want to portray on a cover letter. And so that's one way that we can go about doing that. All right, y'all, that is all I have for you. Um, if you have questions, feel free to email me. The Career Center is doing online appointments and online services throughout this time. So please call our front desk, go on the handshake, sign up for our video appointment or phone appointment. We can talk more specifically about the things that you're applying for. Thanks. Bye.